Good morning, everybody, and welcome to day three of Genetic Genealogy Ireland. You're all very, very welcome. Uh, this is sponsored by Family Tree DNA and organized by volunteers from ISOG, the International Society of Genetic Genealogy. And it gives me great pleasure to announce our first speaker for today, Michelle Leonard. Michelle is a professional uh, genealogist. We've worked very, very closely on uh, a couple of projects. One of our uh, passion projects is uh, World War I and trying to help uh, uh, promote the, the commemoration of the missing soldiers of World War I. And Michelle has done a lot of work on the Fremel project, uh, which many of you will have heard her speaking about previously. But today, Michelle is going to actually blow our minds by telling us how dynamite DNA is and how to ignite our ancestral research with it. So please give a big warm welcome to Michelle Leonard. Good morning, everyone. So, DNA is dynamite, how to ignite your ancestral research. So, this is essentially a talk for beginners, but I may cover a few more advanced things as well. It's going to cover what the different types of DNA tests are, how DNA is inherited, how you can use your DNA results to help with your family tree, how to work with your DNA match list, I'll go over a few case study success stories, and a little bit about third party tools. What can you use DNA testing for? Well, you can use it to confirm and support your family tree research. You can use it to break down brick walls, add branches to your tree, find and connect with new cousins, uh, test theories about relationships, solve adoption, illegitimacy, and any unknown ancestor mysteries, track your surname, and see your ethnic makeup. A word of warning before we get started. Be prepared and prepare others. DNA is the one record set that does not and cannot lie and it's always possible you might find something unexpected or someone you ask to test might find something unexpected. So you have to bear that in mind before you test and before you convince people to test. So the four types of DNA. Yes, four. There are four, not three. Y chromosome found only in males and passed from father to son. So this looks at the father's 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 line. Mitochondrial DNA, found in both males and females, but can only be passed down by a mother to her children. Autosomal DNA covers all of your ancestral lines, 50% inherited from each parent. And the X chromosome, two if you're a woman, one if you're a man. Okay, so we're gonna start by looking at Y DNA, which is the direct paternal line and the surname line. Y DNA is passed from father to son only. The drawback then is only males can test, but Females can ask appropriate males to test for them. It only tests one line of the many on your tree. If you think about your tree, you have eight great-grandparents, 16 great-great, 32 great-great-great. This is just testing one of those lines, so keep that in mind. It is, however, the line that carries your surname. So if you're interested in surname studies, it's a great test to do. And it can reach much further back in time than autosomal DNA, around 250,000 years. There are different types of Y-DNA tests, STR and SNP or SNP tests. I'm not going to talk about SNP tests today, but James Irvine will be talking about those later on in the day. Um, so how do YSTR tests work? Well, when Y-DNA is passed down, although virtually intact, sporadic errors occur in the process, and these are known as mutations. Y-tests examine markers known as short tandem repeats, YSTRs, on the Y chromosome at the places where those, these mutations take place. Each marker gets a numerical value, and these numbers are compared in a Y-DNA database. Only Family Tree DNA offers a Y-DNA database at the moment. So what do these look like? Well, they look like this. It's just a big pile of numbers, really. It's known as a haplotype, but on their own, they don't tell you anything at all. Um, it's all about comparing these markers to other people in the database. The more markers you match on, the closer the relationship. The more mismatches, the more distant the relationship. So, how many markers should you test? Well, the standard test at the moment is 37 markers, so I obviously start there. If you get good matches at 37 markers who are also willing to upgrade to 67 markers, then I would advise you to do that. The highest number of markers you can test at the moment is 111. Okay, so what can you use YDA testing for? Well, any direct male line brick wall, or NPE, is particularly useful for male adoptees. Oh, and by NPE, I mean not the parent expected. I know most people call it non-paternal event, but in my view, there definitely has been a paternal event, so not the parent expected. 
um, and also useful for surname studies and deep ancestry. So, let's say you're adopted or you have a good <coughs> role on your direct paternal line. What can you gain from DNA testing? So, let's look at an example. This is a Y-DNA match list at 67 markers. And this is the client of mine who was adopted, doesn't know who his father was. His top match, the surname you come back, as Robertson. Second top match, Robertson. Third top match, you get the picture of Robertson. Fourth match, Robertson. So what's this telling us? Well, it's telling us that very likely the mystery father could be a Robertson. And I say could be because there are lots of other you know, things that could get in the way of that. But it's a really, really good clue. The most important thing you want to look at when you first uh, look at this list is the little column called genetic distance. Now, what does this mean? Well, his top match is a genetic distance of one. So, what they're doing is they're testing 67 markers against 67 markers. These two people match each other on 66 out of the 67 markers. They don't match on one of them. So that's why a genetic distance of one. So the higher that number, genetic distance, the more distant the match is going to be. If you've got a zero, that's an exact match. So what next? If you have a mystery in your Y line and you're lucky enough to get surname candidates, use this information in conjunction with autosomal testing. Search your autosomal match lists and look for the surname. See if you can find any candidates. Bear in mind that many people won't get this lucky with their Y-DNA test results. Only about 30% may be able to identify a surname at the moment, but as more people test, this will improve. Also bear in mind the identified surname may not be correct due to a disconnect further up the line. Let's say um, my client's father was also adopted or he took his mother's surname. He's not going to be a Robertson then, is he? The other thing you get with your Y-DNA test is your Y-DNA haplogroup. And a haplogroup is a genetic population group of people who share a common ancestor on the paternal or maternal line. Haplogroups are assigned letters of the alphabet and refinements consist of additional number and letter combinations. Basically, this means you share a common ancestor way, way, way back in time if you share a haplogroup. The most common haplogroup for males in Western Europe, including Ireland, is R1B. The, one of the best things that Family Tree DNA has are the projects. There are thousands of projects there run by enthusiastic and knowledgeable volunteers. Um, you have haplogroup projects, surname projects, geographic projects. When you get your Y-DNA results, I urge everyone to join these projects, talk to the administrators, and perhaps you might then want to go into more advanced testing like SNP testing. So we're going to move on now to mitochondrial DNA, which is the direct maternal line. MTDNA is passed on by a mother to both sons and daughters, but sons cannot pass it on. Both males and females can test. It traces a direct maternal line, mother's 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 line. Again, this only pertains to one line of your tree, like the Y. It's the only part of your DNA for which the standard test is full sequencing. You can't go any further than that. And only family tree DNA, again, offer the mitochondrial uh, full sequencing test. It also reaches far back in time, about 200,000 years, so it can give you information on your ancestral origins of your direct maternal line. It is, however, I believe, the least genealogically useful of the tests because it mutates very, very slowly. An exact match could even be 500 years back in time for your most recent common ancestor. So you have to bear that in mind. You might not be able to identify many of your mitochondrial matches. Also, surnames on this line change every generation, usually. Don't discount it, though. It can be really, really great for proving or disproving hypotheses. That's where it comes into its own. If you and another person think you're related on your direct maternal lines, for instance, taking an MD DNA test can provide an answer. So this is my mitochondrial DNA list. And you can see that there's an awful lot of different surnames here. I can't find out anything from that. I want to look at the earliest known ancestor, in case I can find something there. Um, but as you can see in the genetic distance column, it's 0000. I have 224 matches at a genetic distance of zero. And I can't work out any of them in the genealogical time frame. Now that's just mine. That might not be the same for everyone else. Your mileage may vary. But it's just an example of what can happen due to the slow mutation. The other thing you get with your mitochondrial DNA is, again, your haplogroup. All sorts of different haplogroups that you can have. Um, one thing I really, really like to use with this is the advanced matching tool at FTDNA. You can check if people who share your mitochondrial and exact match on there is also a match on your family finder, your autosomal test. And if they match autosomally, there's a better chance that they're closer in time 
uh, than the other a mitochondrial exact match. It's a joint match of some. So it's worth looking at that. Again, there's half a group projects, there's geographic projects, joint projects when you get your results. So we're going to move on now to autosomal DNA, which is going to take up the bulk of my talk. And this covers all your ancestral lines. Autosomal DNA has absolutely exploded in the last few years. I think there's over 9 million people now tested, and over the next few years, this is going to jump to over 20 million. It's a revolution. So what is autosomal DNA? Well, it's a random blend of all the DNA passed down to you by your ancestors. It covers all your ancestral lines and not just one, like Y or mitochondrial. Each new generation, however, recombination takes place and some of the DNA from previous generations drops off. So you have less of your grandparents than you do of your parents and so on and so forth. This limits the reach of autosomal DNA to around 200 to 250 years. The tests are non-gender specific, both men and women can take them. They're best for matching with cousins in the past five to six generations. People could match you on any of your lines. The more DNA segments you match on, the closer the match. The larger the DNA segments you match on, the closer the match. Test your older generations first due to this limited reach. And test as many other close and confirmed relatives as you can to narrow down your search. Test at all the major DNA companies if you can. But you don't know where your best matches may choose to test. And this is especially true for people with a mystery or an adoption. So the DNA testing companies. Well, there's three main DNA testing companies. There's Ancestry DNA, Family Tree DNA, 23 and Me. There's also two new entrants to the fray, and those are Living DNA, a UK company, and My Heritage, a global company. Living DNA doesn't yet have a matching database, but one is promised. All of these companies are here in the hall today, except for 23 and Me, and they have some really good deals. So how is autosomal DNA inherited? Well. In the nucleus of every human cell, there are 46 chromosomes, 23 pairs. And I'm going to emphasize this word pairs because it's a concept that you really, really need to get familiar with. One set from mum, one set from dad, 23 from each. So 22 pairs of these pairs are autosomal chromosomes, known as autosomes. And one pair of them is the sex or gender defining chromosomes. If you get two X's, you're a female. If you get an X and a Y, you're a male. So here's mum and dad, here's you. And dad's got 22 pairs of autosomes and one pair of sex chromosomes, he's got an X and a Y. And mum has also got 22 pairs of autosomes and she's got two X's. Recombination takes place and dad passes down to you one set of 22 brand new autosomes. Half of his 44 all jumbled up together and he passes you down his whole X, his one X. He's only got one to pass down. Mum does the same, she passes you down a jumbled up set of her 44 from uh, autosomes and a new set of 22, and uh, she could either, either pass you down a brand new X chromosome mixed up from her two, or one of her whole chromosomes. So you now have 22 pairs of autosomes of your own, unique to you, and two X chromosomes, except if you're male, you would have had a Y from that. So this is what they look like. And that's chromosome one, and you can see that that's the largest chromosome. They get increasingly smaller as we go down to, to chromosome 22. And you can also see here, it's really, really clear that there are two of them, two copies. And I call these my maternal chromosome one, my paternal chromosome one. The key here is I don't know which is which, and the testing companies can't tell me which is which. They can't differentiate between which is which, but you have to remember that you have two of each. Autosomal DNA, you inherit less, progressively less of it from your ancestors with each passing generation. Maybe around 25% from grandparents, around 12 and a half from great grandparents, and at half as you go up each generation. Approximately. It's important to familiarize yourself with the amounts of DNA different relationships should share with each other. DNA inheritance is random, so these percentages come in ranges and not absolutes. So that's a really key point. Looking at the range of sharing percentages, you have here 50% exactly between parent and child. 50% uh, approximately between a full siblings, 25% uh, half sibling, grandparent, and uncle. You can see there's a lot of relationships there that share the same percentage of DNA. Uh, 12 and a half, a half cousin, uh, a third, first cousin, or a half aunt. Um, by the time you get down to third cousin, you're looking at 0.78 approximately of your DNA. It's quite small. The only absolute here is that you get exactly 50% from each parent. All the rest are approximate. For instance, you could get 23% from one grandparent and 27% from the other. It's just how the cards fall. It's random. The other thing you really need to take on board is 
the amount of centum organs shared. Now, a centum organ is a unit for measuring genetic linkage, and it's usually abbreviated to CM. The most important thing to remember about CMs is that the larger the number, the better the match, the closer the match. That's all you really need to know. So let's look at these amounts that you could share. Maybe 3,400 with a parent, 2,550 with a full sibling, 850 with a first cousin, 53 with a third cousin. Now these are averages. As I say, you must look at the ranges and the best thing for looking at the ranges is a tool called the Shared CM Project run by Dr. Blaine Bettinger. Please use this because it's a fantastic resource for helping with relationship predictions. It's just been updated in the last month and it gives you ranges and it gives you the average. So say looking at a first cousin, the average is 874 centimorgans, but the range is really large, 553 to 1200. That's a large range and anyone in there could be a first cousin. So relationship estimating is a difficult thing to do. Be aware and don't hit on that must be that because it's in that bracket. I'm going to show you an example of the randomness of DNA and heritage inheritance here. I have two second cousins once removed who have tested. The first one shares 295 centimorgans over 12 segments with me. The second shares 23 centimorgans over one segment with me. The exact same relationship level. And that's the difference. Now these are what I call outliers. They're on the extreme ends of high sharing and low sharing. But I have made sure that they are second cousins once removed by how they match with all, a lot of other cousins that I've tested. And they definitely are. So you just need to be careful with these relationship predictions. Another word of warning here. Endogamy, the dreaded word. Endogamy is the practice of marrying within the same ethnic, cultural, social, religious or tribal group. In endogamous populations, everyone will, will descend from the same small gene pool. People will be related to each other in a recent genealogical time frame on multiple different ancestral pathways. They could be third cousins once removed, and fourth cousins, and fourth cousins once removed, all in different ways. And the same ancestors are therefore going to appear in their tree in several different places. If you have endogamy, you have to disregard the predicted relationships and ranges of centum organs because Distant cousins are going to share more DNA with you, and it's just not going to work. So your results have arrived. What next? Well, they consist of two main components. You get an ethnicity estimate, and you get a DNA match list. So let's look at the ethnicity estimates, or add mixture. This is an ethnicity estimate from Family Tree DNA for my cousin Marion. And you can look at it in more depth, you can see all of the regions that they cover, and it's telling us that Marion has 74% British Isles and 23% Jewish diaspora. And I'm just pointing this out because Marion has an unknown grandfather. The other three quarters of her tree I have, and there's no Jewish there. So maybe this is giving me a clue as to the unknown grandfather. But we have to be very careful with these ethnicity estimates. Ethnicity estimates will vary between companies because they have different reference populations. They're really only accurate to the continental level. They cannot be taken too literally and there will be errors. Your ethnicity estimate can only cover the DNA you personally inherited from your ancestors and you don't have all the same DNA that they did. They can give you a broad idea of your origins and may provide genealogical clues like for Marion if you have a mystery. But this is an emerging science that will improve over time as more people test and reference populations increase. But at the moment, it's something that you shouldn't be fair too much from. So the DNA match list. This is the most important thing you get with your DNA results. It really is all about the cousins for me. This is my family finder of the match list here. It tells me the number of matches I've got, over 3,000, it gives me their names, the relationship range, again, we have to be careful with that. The shared centimorgans. I don't look at this column very carefully, and I'll tell you why, because the family DNA include a lot of very, very small segments that um, I think uh, it's better to count out. The longest block, I often uh, alter it to see this list by longest block. X match, again, be careful with that, because it could just be a one centimorgan segment that's telling you it's an X match. Um, linked relationship, now that's really good. In, in order to get those, you have to upload your family tree to Family Tree DNA. You have to put the cousins who have tested on your family tree and link them together. And when you do that, 
you can get these things called buckets, which is a, a, a bit of phasing, really, um, which basically is uh, taking your matches and splitting them into maternal and paternal. And I've tested my mum, so I have this maternal bucket, and all of these people that have a little red next to them are put in my maternal bucket. They're a maternal match because they match my mum. And because I've linked her up, I get this. I've also tested lots of paternal first cousins. And again, because I've linked them up, I've got a paternal bucket with matches that match them going in the paternal bucket. The both bucket is usually only for full siblings or people who may match you on both sides of your tree. So, initial tips. Upload your family tree if you know anything at all. You will be helping yourself and others. Use DNA in conjunction with traditional research, as that is how to get the most out of it, and I'll show you why later. Start with your largest matches first and work your way down. Search your entire match list for common surnames and common locations. If a match has both, you have a better chance of identifying them. Study shared matches if they may hold the vital clue, especially if you have no tree to work with. Be proactive, contact your matches. Many won't respond, but you will find new cousins to collaborate with. It takes work, hard work at times. Use the search boxes, no matter which company you're using, they have search boxes. I'm going to use the advanced search in Family Tree DNA here, and I'm going to search for my ancestral surname, Clelland. Now, my Clelands lived in Ayrshire in Scotland, so I'm looking for people who have Clelands from Ayrshire on their surname list. And I get this back, and there's lots of McClellans, which I don't want, but there's this one here, Clelland, Ayrshire, Scotland. It matches both my criteria, and in fact, it turns out to be my mother's first, fourth cousin once removed. So don't discount looking at these smaller matches if they share common surnames and common locations. Not all of your cousins will match you. The chances of matching a first cousin or a second cousin are, are basically 100%. There's no proven case of second cousins not matching each other. So if anyone who is a second cousin or closer doesn't match you, you have to start asking a few awkward questions. But below that level, it starts to go down. Third cousins, maybe only 90% of them will match you. Fourth cousins, maybe 50-50. Uh, by the time you get down to six cousins, maybe only 2%. Of course, you're gonna have way more of these fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth cousins out there in the world, so you're gonna have a lot more of these matches that you can't work out. But you can still work out if a third or a fourth cousin, etc., that doesn't match you is a third or fourth cousin by testing other people, because they might not match you, but they might, might match your brother or your sister or your first cousin. Not all of your matches will be real cousins. And this is important too. Many very small segments are false, and they're known as identical by chance. Basically, uh, an error in the process occurs, and they're not a match at all. Research suggests 100% of, of segments, 15 centimorgans or more, are what we call identical by descent, real, who have a common ancestor. But only 14% of of five centimorgan segments are real. So the lower you get, the less chance there is of it being a real segment and much higher chance of it being false. This doesn't mean totally discount smaller segments or smaller matches, especially again if you find those common surnames and locations, but just be careful with them and don't make them a main focus. You're starting out, start with your highest matches first. This, just to illustrate the point, is a confirmed third cousin of mine. I only share one segment of eight centimorgans with him. He comes up as a fifth cousin remote. This is a match I probably wouldn't really look at, but it's my third cousin. So be careful not to throw the baby out of the bathwater. So how to narrow down your results? Well, test your own to generations. Test your own to generations. They have more of your ancestors' DNA than you do. If you don't have older generations to test, test your peers. Half siblings, first cousins, second cousins. First cousins are going to narrow you down to your grandparents, second cousins to your great grandparents. This really helps. Both siblings aren't included for narrowing purposes because they can only tell you parents, but there are also very important testers if you don't have parents to test because you, got, you share 50% with a full sibling, but there's 50% you don't share. You each got different bits for your parents. So let's look at some examples. I mean, we're going to talk about confirming lines on your tree here. And this to me is gold dust, absolutely priceless. Because I've spent years and years and years building my tree, my paper research, and I want to know it's correct. And DNA is giving me the chance to confirm these and verify these. So we're gonna concentrate on a match called Christy. Christy is supposed to be a second to fourth cousin uh, to my mom. And the first tool I want to look at is the in common with tool, which is shared matches. 
and Kirsty has in common with my mom a woman named Isabel. And Isabel is my mom's maternal first cousin. So it's very likely that Christy is related to my mom via her maternal side. So the next thing I want to do is look at all of the three of them in the chromosome browser, which is an amazing tool. And this is what it looks like. You get all 23 of your chromosomes. And one thing you'll notice is there's only one line. Remember, you have two copies, but it can't differentiate, so you only get one line. So you don't know which copy. So let's look at this. There's a match in chromosome 7. Christy and Isabel. Isabel is the blue colour, and you can see as a first cousin, she shares a lot of DNA with my mum. Uh, Christy only shares two segments. She's the orange colour. But in chromosome 7, they look like they share on the same piece of DNA. And as they match each other, it's very likely they do, but we can't tell that from this. All it's telling us is they both match on chromosome 7, but they could match on different copies of our chromosome 7. Now yesterday, I would have told you, you have to go and ask Christy, you have to go and ask Isabel to look at their chromosome browser and tell you if they match. But Roberta Estes, uh, yesterday evening, gave us a surprise and told us about a brand new tool uh, developed by a developer called Joran Runfeld, um, called the Triangulator. And this is it, I used it last night, and it confirms that Christy and my mom and Isabel all share that same segment of chromosome 7. So check that out and use it. It's a great tool. Um, the next thing I do is look at the data in a table. There's a little um, way to do this on the chromosome browser page. And I add up all the segments that Christy and my mom share that are above six, seven centimorgans. And I discount all the tiny ones. So the total we get is actually 71 centimorgans instead of the 96 the main page tells us. So check that with your chart. And try and work out what relationship this could be at 71 centimorgans. There's a few possibilities. The next thing I want to do is I want to check if we've got common surnames, and we do. We've got a number of them, and they're all bolded at the top here. Why are they bolded at the top? Well, because I have uploaded my family tree. And when you do that, the system works for you. It looks for the surnames that are on your tree and other people's trees, and when it finds any, it folds them and puts them to the top of the list. So we've got a number of options here that could possibly be our common ancestors. Next thing I want to do, look at Christie's tree. And she's got a tree because look here, her little tree symbol is folded in blue. If it's grey, they don't have a tree. Okay? So here's her tree and I have pushed it forward to her second great grandmother because that's a section of her tree I found Scottish names on. And one name in particular stands out to me, William Berry. And he was her fourth great grandfather. And he's married to a Mary Bullock. Now, looking at my maternal grandmother's tree, because we know already that that's where Christine and my mum match, I have a William Berry too. But he was married to a Mary Somerville. Were they the same person? What's going on here? Well, this is the marriage of William to Mary Somerville in 1860. And he says he's 39 years old. He was more like 47. He says he's a carter and a bachelor. Okay? So he's a bachelor. And this is the marriage of Christie's fourth great-grandfather, William Berry, to Mary Willock, nearly 20 years earlier in 1841. And he's getting married like, just the next town over from William, who marries Mary in 1860. And this is my Berry family on the 1841 census. And I never noticed this person before at the bottom. Uh, this is John Berry, who's my William's dad, and jo Jean, who's his sister. And right at the bottom here, there's Mary Bullock, William's wife. So yes, they're the same person. Christy and I are half fourth cousins once removed. And in fact, this led me to uh, find out that my William had been rather naughty and was not a bachelor at all. And uh, poor Mary, Mary number one, as I call her, was perfectly alive and well in the 1861 census. And um, in fact, she outlived him. And um, she uh, found out about his antics in the next town over and wasn't too impressed and shot him to the police. So I have uh, lots of great records, trial transcripts, uh, witness statements from both Marys. Mary too uh, said she had no knowledge whatsoever of the bigamy. And uh, my uh, third great grandfather was uh, sent to prison for three years. <laughs> dear, dear me. <laughs> so this. DNA led me to this amazing story in my family tree. 
breaking down brick walls. <laughs> okay, we're going to move on to my paternal second great grandfather, Street John Cullen. And his father was Robert Cullen, and he's a brick wall. Died in the 1820s. I have no documentation to tell me who his parents were. I'm stuck. I found a long time ago that Robert Cullen born in 1802 in Glasgow. Might be him, parents John Cullen and Elizabeth Morton. But you didn't have to register a birth in Scotland at that time, so he might have been not, not been registered, he might have been born elsewhere. I can't, this is too speculative, I can't add this to my tree. Then Jan, a DNA match, comes along. Jan has Cullens and Whiteheads on her tree. And there they are. We have the same third great grandparents, Robert Cullen <coughs> and Margaret Whitehead. So we are fourth cousins exactly, but does this help me with my brick wall? Well, yes, it does, because she has put John and Elizabeth Morton on her tree. What does she know that I don't? Well, she knows that her great-grandmother had the middle name of Morton. She was named after the Elizabeth Morton. That's a really, really good piece of evidence to prove that they, they were his parents. And indeed, since then, I've had three further matches directly to John and Elizabeth. Um, and I've even got this amazing photograph of their daughter, Christian Cullen, taken in 1855, and her daughter Elizabeth via these new DNA matches. Proving and hypotheses. Okay, so I have a hypothesis. My granddad, Michael Leonard, his grandmother was Elizabeth Leonard, and her father was John, and his father was Jeremiah Leonard, who was a farmer in Ireland sometime in the mid to late 1700s. That's all I know about poor Jeremiah. So my John and Margaret, though, they, they left Ireland and came to Scotland in the 1840s with their children. <coughs> and here we find them at 84 Waterside in Dove Mellington on the 1851 census in Scotland. And right next door, the very next household, same place, 84 Waterside, another Leonard family, headed by a man named Darby Leonard. Darby? But he's the right age to have been maybe the eldest son of John and Margaret, and I've always believed that he is my Elizabeth's brother. Poor Darby, though, he died between 1851 and 1855, when statutory registration started in Scotland, so I have no documentation to prove it, once again. And the other thing I did was I found out that Darby is the Irish nickname for none other than Jeremiah. Named after the father? This is my thinking, but it's all conjectural and speculative evidence. But I've done his tree anyway, and I found that he had a son, Patrick, who married a woman named Jane Doyle. Keep that in mind. So I get a new match. This one's an ancestry, pretty decent, 38 centimorgans over one segment. I contact her, I find out her maternal grandfather was a man named Ignatius Leonard. Ignatius? What a great name. I saw I trace his birth, 1916, in Lanarkshire, and I get his parents' marriage certificate, and you could have seen me dancing around the archives when I got this marriage certificate. Because on it, it tells me his parents were Patrick Leonard and Jane Doyle. So, Ignatius is Jeremiah Darby's great-grandson. I have DNA in common with them. And I, just this last week, got another match from a direct ancestor, direct descendant of Jeremiah's. So I've not proven conclusively that my Elizabeth and Jeremiah Darby were siblings, but it's a really great piece of evidence to add to all my other circumstantial evidence, and I think that really makes it almost certain my hypothesis is correct. We're going to talk a little bit about X now, X DNA. X chromosome matching is included with autosomal tests, but it's not visible on Ancestry, so if you want to see your X matches there, you have to upload to GEDmatch. A match on the X chromosome is different to a match on an autosomal chromosome. Why? Well, you can only inherit X chromosome DNA from certain ancestors, and your gender is a big factor. Women have twice the X men do they? two X chromosomes. So they have many more matches. X DNA often doesn't recombine when it's passed down too. It can pass through several generations untouched. So often a match on the X could be further back than a match on an autosome. This is a male X DNA chart and all of the white ancestors, the man didn't get any X DNA from those. So that's a lot of ancestors you can kick out from your analysis. And even on his mother's side there's a lot of white that you don't need to look at. You can just brush those ancestors away. He couldn't have got X from them. Female chart has more options, but still there's lots of white, lots of lines that you can discount. Now, the best thing to do with your X chromosome is to create your own X DNA table or chart using your tree. All of the colored boxes here are uh, ancestors I got X DNA from, or I couldn't have got X DNA from. 
The white are the ones I didn't. So whenever I get an XDNA match, I can solve this, and I can go, okay, these are the possibilities. So we're gonna look at a match, Ruth. She's an X match, and actually she's a proper one because she's got a really decent sized segment of 35 centimorgans. And we're gonna look at Ruth's in common with list. The main thing here is my mom's not on it. So she's on my paternal X chromosome, which came wholly from my paternal grandmother. So because this is an X match, I've got it right back to my paternal grandmother straight away. This is a section of my table that has my paternal X on it. And if we look 100% from my dad, 100% from my grandmother, and then we're not, sh we can't be sure of these percentages. But the person that it seems quite likely I may have got a lot of X from is Margaret McPherson. Maybe 50% or more is possible here. So I keep her in mind whenever I get X matches. I can, uh, so Ruth sends me her tree, and one name stands out Anne McPherson. And there's my Margaret, so she could have got X from Anne, I could have got X from Margaret, but could they be related? Well, yes, they're sisters. And this DNA match gave me evidence for Anne's life. So, third party tools, very quickly. Make use of third party tools. The most important of these is GEDmatch. GEDmatch is a fantastic and free third party tool. It can help you match against those in all the major databases, and it provides better tools for analyzing your DNA. DNA GEDcom is another great one. It offers a really good suite of tools that you should look at. Genome Make Pro is an excellent program for organizing your data. I use it almost every day, but it is time consuming and it's not for everyone. DNA Painter is a brand new tool that's just come out in the last month and uh, I really urge you to check it out. So this is GEDmatch. Lots of tools there, one to many, you want to use often, one to one, people who match both kits, are your parents related, um, you have X match lists, X one to ones, all sorts of things that you can look at. They also have tier one utilities, which you can pay $10 a month for, um, and I do this and I use these uh, tools very often as well. I would say get to grips with the basic tools first before trying them out, but give them a go and see what you think. DNA GEDCOM, one of the best things about DNA GEDCOM I like is the autosomal DNA segment analyzer, the ADSA. Um, it gives you this really great chart and it's a good way of visualizing your matches and maybe finding pile-up regions. Pile-up regions are ones where an awful lot of people match with the same segment, so it may be way back in time. Population segment, perhaps. Genome Mate Pro, this is what it looks like, and it organizes your data by a chromosome, so you can see all these different people that match in the same spot of the, the chromosomes extremely helpful. You can put all your data in it, you can add lots of notes, and you can do segment, segment mapping there as well. And this is my segment map at Genome Make Pro, and I am mapping all of my segments, color coding them to all of my different ancestors and ancestral groups. DNA Painter is doing something similar, chromosome painting and mapping again, um, but they have a few other little tools that go with it that I really like. So, some resources. I saw the International Society of Genetic Genealogy. Uh, please join, it's free. Uh, use the I saw wiki, it's full of great information. Do the blogs, join the Facebook groups. There's uh, a couple uh, of the handout that I'm going to give you. Um, there's mailing lists, watch webinars, YouTube videos. Immerse yourself in the learning. But the most important thing of all is practicing. You don't really get to understand it properly until you're practicing it. Traditional literature, uh, the Family Tree Guide to DNA Testing and Genetic Genealogy by Dr. Lee Rettinger has become a bit of a bible in the last year in this, in this sphere. Um, and Genetic Genealogy, The Basics and Beyond by Emily Ogacino is a great uh, book for beginners and Emily is here and selling her books at the Family Tree DNA stall. So summing up, pick the correct test to match your goals. Use your DNA tests in conjunction with traditional research to get the best results. Test close relatives, especially older generations to narrow down your matches and gain more of your ancestors' DNA to work with. Upload your family tree, no matter how small. Make cousin connections and work together. Organize your data and take advantage of all the help out there. Most of all, have fun with it. And this is a link to my handout if you don't want the paper copy. There are paper copies here, um, but you can take a photograph of that if you would like. Read up for a minute. <laughs>
and just some contact details, Facebook, Twitter, etc. Oh, I don't know, have we time for questions or any questions? Well, we don't actually, because yep. <laughs> we are very, very close to it. You can take photographs of that. We're very close to um, the hour, and uh, we are going to make room for the next speaker. Okay. But um, you're going to be around for I the entire am day. around the entire day. I'll be flitting about in here and the Family Tree DNA stall. So any questions at all, um, just come and see me now. I'll be back here for a while after the talk ends if you want to come up and speak to me. Thanks a lot. Great. Thank you, Michelle.